Well, today's talk is just going to be a quick overview about weed control in Apple systems. And managing weeds is important in our orchard crops, and, and it's important for a variety of reasons. Obviously, because we want to minimize competition for water, light, and nutrients. And that's really important for new plantings, but it's also really important for systems that are on dwarf root stocks, root stocks with shallow root systems in high density arrangements that can be more sensitive to that competition. Large vegetation within an orchard system can actually impact the deposition of other crop protection chemicals. And also large weeds could facilitate uh, the potential for increased herbicide drift within an orchard system from the herbicides that you're actually already applying. And that can influence the development of crop injury. Weeds can be a habitat for invertebrate and vertebrate pests, so voles or mice that might thrive under a, a system that's got a lot of vegetative ground cover. It can alter the microclimates that influence disease development, and then it can just interfere with harvest operations by large unmanaged weeds getting in the way of, of human manpower. So, Take home messages always when we're talking weeds and weed management, you want to start clean. So that's within the first two years as you're thinking about establishing an apple orchard as you're putting it in. Make sure your site is as weed free as possible manage those weeds as you're just getting started and manage, you know. Um, really well the the vegetation during your first two years because that's when your trees are going to be most sensitive to competition and then start early within any given season during may and june that is the most vital time for managing weeds in in apple orchard systems so again starting clean and staying clean start clean when you get your orchard started and, and start clean at the start of a new season uh, as your apples are going into flowering. So if we talk about weed control, a lot of people wanna talk about herbicides. And there's a lot of questions about herbicides, you know, particularly because we refer to herbicides in so many different ways that sometimes the terminology can get confusing. So sometimes we talk about herbicides with respect to their activity. Are you using a contact herbicide, so a herbicide that just kills the tissue that it touches, or are we talking systemic herbicides? So herbicides that are translocated within plants and that cause injury at in locations that are different from where uh, the plant was treated. Are we talking about the selectivity of the herbicide? So are we talking herbicides that are broadly specific or are grass specific or non-selective and will control weeds across a wide spectrum of you know, uh, genera or a wide spectrum of growth habits and life history traits? Sometimes when we're talking about herbicides, we're talking about the timing of herbicides and when they're applied, particularly relative to weed emergence. So whether they're applied prior to weeds emerging, so sometimes we've, we've heard of these as soil applied or residual herbicides or after weeds emerge. So foliar applied herbicides and those foliar applied herbicides can be those contact or systemic products that we've talked about. We talk about herbicides relative uh, to crop age. So whether we can use them during the establishment phase of an orchard, uh, whether we can use them in non-bearing systems or whether they're only really designed for a mature tree or a bearing fruit environment. And then we can talk about another timing issue is whether we're using them in season or whether these are dormant applications that we're putting on, say, in the, the fall or the very early spring before our, our crops are actively growing. And what's really important to understand is that these designations can overlap with each other. And I just want to bring up and kind of just show you some of the products that we're, we're talking about uh, with respect to weed management in Apple system. So we have our active ingredients. So this is the chemical that's actually doing the, the, the work. This is the herbicidal compound in those formulated products that we, we buy. 
And then we talked about selectivity. So for instance, you know, we're talking about, are they annual grasses, AG? Do they go after perennial grasses, PG? Or annual broadleaves, ABL? Or perennial broadleaves, PBL, right? And you can see that these are, are pre-emergence herbicides and the spectrum that they control is, 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 is very, you know, varied depending on the chemical that we're talking about. So example, pendimethalin, it might get some small seeded broadleaves, but it's primarily a grass herbicide that gets annual grasses. Uh, whereas something like uh, simazine, you know, we really think of this more as a, a chemical for controlling annual broadleaf weeds. And then so that we talked about, you know, the timing with respect to orchard age. Uh, you know, some of these herbicides, you know, don't have a lot of restrictions on them, while others, you know, are only allowed to be used in like a non-bearing system. So you've got to read the label and think, you know, about when you're going to use these products, uh, who you're going to use these products against. Uh, understand that not all of these active ingredients are really suitable for all rootstocks, and they might not be labeled for use in all New York counties. Uh, for example, Long Island is going to have certain restrictions on the products that they can apply uh, in their production environments. Some of these chemicals are going to be federally restricted, uh, so it's, it's going to be um, limited in, in who is going to be allowed to apply them. We got something very similar with our post-emergence and our foliar applied herbicides. Again, these products can vary significantly in who they can control and you know, when they can be applied. So some can be applied within the first season of production, others need to wait you know, till a year has passed and the trees become established. A product like glyphosate is a non-spectrum herbicide that can control both annual grasses and annual broadleaves, as well as perennial broadleaves and perennial grasses. Something like carfentrazone, which is not a systemic herbicide, glyphosate is a systemic herbicide. Uh, carfentrazone is not. Uh, you know, this really targets our annual broadleaves more so than other species like grasses. So you have to be really aware of the species that you're going to be managing and if they're going to be sensitive to the herbicides that you have available for use in your system or not. Again, always read the label before using products. It's gonna tell you one, how to protect yourself, two, what rates you should be using, three, what kind of adjuvants um, and other tank, um, you know, additives you should be considering. It's going to tell you whether it can or can't be used in specific counties. You know, it's going to tell you if there are certain types of protection that need to be applied uh, to your, your trees or not. A lot of important information. Again, I always think about reading the label. So I wanted to talk and just bring up variability in, in herbicides and how they're used and the kind of performance they can achieve. And I always wanna talk about glyphosate and glufosinate because sometimes I feel that uh, people get them a bit confused because they sound so similar if we're not using the trade names when we're discussing them, if we're just talking glyphosate and glufosinate. Glyphosate currently is, is marketed under the trade name Roundup as well as other trade names. There are hundreds to thousands of glyphosate containing products out there. Not all might be registered for use in tree crops, whereas glufosinate would go under the trade name uh, Rely. Glyphosate uh, is a systemic herbicide. It is translocated well. Glufosinate has very limited translocation, so it's much more of a contact herbicide than glyphosate is. With glyphosate, we want to get good coverage. We really do. Obviously, we want to we want to make sure our plants are, are treated, but coverage is probably a little less critical because the herbicide moves around the plant than it is. Um, say with glufosinate, this being more of a contact herbicide, we need that coverage to make sure we optimize our chances for control. Both are non-selective herbicides, but not necessarily non-selective in the same way. 
You know, I'd argue glyphosate is good against annual broadleaf weeds. It's good against annual grasses and it can give us good perennial control. Maybe not like a single shot controlling perennial weeds, but it's gonna provide a lot more suppression of those perennials that we don't want to become established in our orchard systems than a contact herbicide would. Glufosinate is a non-selective herbicide, but it's really good against annual broadleaf weeds. We wanna get them while they're small, probably a bit variable against the annual grasses. And you know, because it's more of a contact herbicide, it's not going to control the perennials um, in the same way that glyphosate is. So just kind of to show you how our discussions of these different ways of talking about herbicides can vary and that not all herbicides, when we say they're non-selective, not all of that, those herbicides are equally non-selective. So we talk about herbicides and we also classify the herbicides. If you, if you go and you, you look at the jugs that you have available, you know, in your, your pesticide storeroom, you're going to see a code on each of these herbicides and they're going to say WSSA group whatever. So one, two, three, four, nine, you know, 20, 29. And that refers to the, the mode of action, the way that these herbicides actually control the weeds and, you know, how they might be used and what kind of control or damage you can expect to see. And we break our herbicides up into some really general category. So even though we have these WSSA1, WSSA3, 4, 29, all of these herbicides are pretty much acting to influence or restrict the growth of the weed. So they go in and whether it's by inhibiting fatty acid synthesis, whether it's affecting the growth and development of the, of the plant or inhibiting cell division or cell wall biosynthesis. They're all basically inhibiting how the plants develop. And by inhibiting how the plants develop and by, by preventing weed growth and, and biomass accumulation, basically it just, it shuts the weeds down. There's another set of herbicides. Again, you know, when you when you go and you're looking at your your categories on your herbicide labels, and these are tissue destroying herbicides. So these are herbicides. Actually, what they do, I'm going to tell you, pretty much they all act the same way, even though they have different modes of action. They get in there, they generate reactive oxygen molecules, ultimately, pretty much, and they just go and destroy tissue that way. And, and you're gonna, you recognize these. These are the herbicides that come in and they just burn tissue after they come into contact with it. One thing I do wanna mention about the herbicides that we do have available to, to us for use in orchard systems is that they're not immune to the development of herbicide resistance. We tend to think of herbicide resistance as being a, a problem of agronomic crops, of corn, of soybean, of cotton, but it's not true. There's a lot of weeds in the United States that are resistant to groups of herbicides, the WSSA groups that are listed for use in apples in New York. Uh, so we need to be thinking that there's always a possibility that could, we could encounter herbicide resistant weeds even in our perennial production environments. And in fact, we have actually selected for herbicide resistance in tree and vine systems. 144 confirmed cases worldwide where resistance has developed in tree and vine systems through the use of herbicide in those crops. 24 of those confirmed cases are in the US. Now they're all in California, Michigan, New Mexico, Oregon, and Washington, but it we do have resistance that has developed. So that includes to glyphosate, that includes our photosystem two inhibitors, um, our photosystem one diverters, that would be paraquat, ACCase inhibitors, that's gonna be our grass herbicides, ALS inhibitors, glufosinate, we have resistance to glufosinate that's developed out on the west coast of the United States. And some species that have developed resistance in other parts of the world or other parts of the US are 
potential problems here in our production environments, whether they're in our trees and vines, our berry systems, or whether they're in uh, the systems that are around our tree and vine and berry systems, and that could easily move into our production environments, for example, horse weed. Lastly, I just want to touch on perennial weeds in orchards, and we'll, we'll talk about two, field bindweed and yellow nutsedge, because these are species that I've been asked to talk about since uh, getting here in New York. Field bindweed, Convolvulus sarvensis. There's another bindweed out there called hedge bindweed, Calistegia sepium. They're both very similar, although slightly different in, in how they look and how they respond to herbicides. But field bindweed is a broadleaf perennial vine with an extensive root system. Its tap roots go to 30 feet deep and it produces these spreading regenerative rhizomes. And so it just, it just grows through the soil and becomes very difficult to eradicate. Uh, these prostrate vines that become climbing uh, under shade conditions, they start growing up um, you know, tree trunks, or they start growing up grapevines, they start getting uh, entangled up in, in, in berry branches. Uh, flowering occurs throughout the summer until up until frost. They don't produce as much seed as maybe some of the annuals do, but they can still, if they get a foothold in your orchard, can produce millions of seed per acre. And those seed can persist for decades in the soil. So this is, is field bindweed, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's a morning glory. It's in the morning glory family. Morning glories are annual species and you'll differentiate field bindweed from them by, again, that perennial root system. And, and this is it. You can see those rhizomes and you can see that new growth coming off and how new vines are just branching out from buds that develop on that root system. Another weed that people have asked about is yellow nutsedge. It's, it's problematic across a wide range of systems. It is a grass-like perennial. It's got stiff leaves that are V-shaped in a cross section and pointed at the tip. And a lot of people sometimes confuse this as a grass. Uh, don't, because the grass herbicides that we apply aren't going to be effective against it because it's, it's not a grass species. Yellow nut sedge produces yellow gold flowers and clusters up at the top. Uh, it does produce seed, but those seed are, are really not what we're worried about. It's the nutlids that are produced on the rhizomes. This is how the species really reproduces, and these tubers can persist for three to five years in the soil and, and just make this a problem over time. Again, we talked about sedges are not grasses, right? So there's, a, there's an old rhyme called sedges have edges and brushes are round and grasses have nodes from tips to the ground. And that's how you can tell these species apart. If you've got V-shaped, really stiff V-shaped leaves, you've probably got a sedge. If you've got triangular stems, you've got a sedge. If they're perfectly round, and, and you would sort of snap them off if, as long as it's not wild garlic or onion, you're looking at a rush. And if you've got nodes, you know, and leaves uh, that are, are developing from those nodes and you've got a grass species. And again, sedges are not gonna be controlled by those grass specific herbicides. So if you wanna go put cethoxidem or clethidem or fluazifop or, or whatever system you're in and whatever grass herbicide you wanna use, it's not gonna control those sedge species. Again, uh, some pictures of nut sedge, that, that very pointed tip, those yellow flowers. And again, here shows you the, the, the root system. You can see the tuber in the leftmost picture. That's a new nutlet that's developing off of that mother plant. And that mother plant's gonna push out multiple nutlets towards the end of the summer. And those are going to you know, uh, perpetuate the species in the system. So when we talk about perennial weed control, there's probably few herbicides really that are available to control these species effectively. You're looking at systemic herbicides, so products like glyphosate. In the case of nutsedge, you're looking at uh, rim sulfuron for managing those species. So you need to be thinking about how you can control perennial weeds um, in advance of, of needing to rely solely on systemic herbicides. So if you can eradicate them uh, before planting or prevent their establishment within a production environment, 
mm, definitely do that. So for instance, with bindweed, if, if you don't wanna be using herbicides, if, if you can cultivate a system every two to three weeks, um, to try and, and fragment those rhizomes and exhaust the nutrient reserves. That might be something you really need to consider. Nutsedge likes uh, wet growing conditions. So if there's some way to change, you know, how water is distributed in your orchard or how it collects or pools or puddles or how much is being applied. If you can eliminate wet conditions, you can culturally, you know, work towards managing nutsedge in that environment. Both species are, you know, sensitive to shading. So if we start getting a lot of shade in the system, you know, we can start to see suppression of both bindweed and nutsedge, but here might be our problem in our high density orchard environments. We might have more light penetrating that soil surface. And so that shading we might have relied on you know, in, in previous production environments isn't necessarily going to be true, isn't necessarily going to, you know, be available as a tool for us now. So definitely be thinking again, you know, not just, you know, herbicides, but be thinking about the biology of the species, the ecology of the species you're working with. And, and how, what you're doing in your production environments, whether it's mowing, uh, whether it's using cover crops, whether it's relying on shading, if you have an older apple orchard that does have that well-developed canopy uh, that can, you know, work towards your advantage when it comes to suppressing weeds. I just wanna thank you very much for your time. Uh, you can always feel free to contact me uh, at Cornell. Uh, best way probably is through my email, lms438 at cornell.edu. And again, I very much appreciate uh, you taking the time and listening to this very quick overview of weed management and orchard systems.